Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Both here with your instant reaction. And yes, not in Morgantown this weekend. I left that to Drew and D.Y. It's great timing. Uh, I did it to just kind of be a good family guy, but it also turned out that, uh, you know, Wednesday night started feeling a little sore throat come on, and I haven't been at 100% since then. So if I sound like crap and you hate this, you can turn it off. Uh, go catch Drew and D.Y.'s coverage over at KSO over at On3. But uh, for my thoughts from the game and just a quick overview of what K-State has in front of them now after their 6-1 and one start to the season, 3-1 and one in Big 12 play, look, they – they blew past West Virginia tonight, 45 to 18. And it was significant because case they faced a little bit of adversity to their own doing early in the game. The defense struggled in certain aspects early on. Tackling was probably the most notable thing. They were bad there. Garrett Green's legs did impact the game early on, but Kind of coincidentally, the biggest play of the first half for K-State may not have even been Marquis Siegel's pick six. It was probably getting that fourth down stop right before the half that prevented West Virginia from tying the game at 17-17 going into the break. Instead, K-State had the lead. They were going to get the ball coming out. And in addition to that play, Garrett Green gets hit on the fourth down throw, gets an upper body injury. He doesn't return for the second half. And in addition to that, K-State's defense, while they struggled at points tonight, they put a punishing on the West Virginia offense. So Garrett Green did not return. West Virginia's tackle, Wyatt Milam, who could very well be a first-round pick in the NFL draft this year, probably the Big 12's best offensive lineman. Uh, He didn't come back for the second half. And then Jaheim White, their top rusher did not come back for the second half. So K-State was in a good spot from that point. And there you just, thought, okay, defense has to tighten up a little bit. Offense, get some time actually on the field because there was a stretch there where Avery Johnson and the offense didn't see the field for almost 30 minutes, and they didn't miss a beat. They came out. They looked good. They did exactly what you would have wanted them to do. Uh, And Avery Johnson, it ultimately led to his best night passing the football at K-State. Look, the the completions, you look around 19 of 29, you think, "Eh, that's not anything special, not anything good, but he – it was better than the 19 of 29 would suggest. And then obviously 298, that is the most yards he's thrown for in his career was too shy of 300. If Jace Brown just helps him out one or two times, uh, he gets to that 300 yard mark, but three touchdowns through the air, no picks. And I don't know if it was by design or if it was because of the lingering injury situation last week against Colorado uh, with, with his, the middle part of his body, but there were no runs for Avery Johnson tonight improvised or designed. They weren't there. There was one play where he was getting chased down from behind and he was able to get rid of it. And, but it didn't look like his normal speed. So I don't know if he was going not at full speed, speed with his running tonight or if that was something where he was limited because of the injury that he just sustained at Colorado but it's something to monitor moving forward because look West Virginia is a team in a bad spot three and four now two and two in big 12 play but they feel like they're even worse off than that and Neil Brown I there's a chance that depending on when you're watching this like I I don't know if West Virginia finds the cash to to get him out of there uh, but I think they would probably like to uh, and this seems like the kind of game that gets you fired mid-season and you get a reset of the program but uh, you're gonna need to have those legs next week against a KU team that's rejuvenated in the way that they played after they demolished Houston today, 42 to 14. So it's going to be fascinating to see where the health is and also kind of hear what Avery Johnson, Chris Kleiman have to say uh, after the game tonight. And then also uh, on Monday when they have their normal press conferences to set the stage for the Sunflower showdown, but good night throwing the ball for K state. They took advantage of a West Virginia pass defense that is already really bad. And then going into the game, uh, just beforehand, West Virginia was without two of their top defensive backs. Their top pass rusher was also banged up, and he continued to kind of get dinged throughout the game. So this was the perfect situation for K-State, and they delivered through the air. And this was, I think, a, a good test for them before KU because you felt like the passing game has been getting better and better. But sometimes it's nice to be able to go out and have a test in front of you that should be easier. But the the way to measure it up is, do you go out and do you handle it? Do you dominate it? That's what K-State did tonight. Uh, I, I would equate it to basically, you know, if you took uh, 
like uh, you take a, a decent golfer and say, okay, you normally play the blue tees. We're going to throw you out there and you're going to, you're going to play from the yellows today. Look, you're, you're going to find yourself in some different situations that you're normally not in when you're playing from the blue tees, but you're going to be given a situation that in theory should be easier for you to play. And that's kind of what this felt like for K-State tonight. This felt like moving up to the yellow tees. And I think it took them a second to kind of get acclimated, but the offense locked in. They executed through the air. The passing game should feel really good going into next week against Kansas. And that's really what it's all about, especially since KU had Kobe Bryant with three interceptions today on Houston. So uh, KU is going to obviously be looking to get their takeaways through the air. And uh, that's that's really where this goes to because – K-State's offense was pretty impressive throughout the night. Um, there's really not anybody to kind of go at and say that they had a down night on the offensive side of the ball. Um, the run game was not there. West Virginia, number one, has a really good run defense, kind of similar to K-State, how they're built, where the run defense is pretty solid. The pass defense has a lot to, to improve on. And then in addition to that, you know with K-State, DJ Giddens is the story, so you can sell out on that even more. I think it's even easier to do when you already have a bad pass defense to just say, okay, let's shut down the run and hope for the best in making them throw. But, you know, worst night of DJ Giddens' uh, career since Texas last year in 2023 um, when he had 22 yards rushing tonight, though, 57 yards on 19 carries. So not a great night, but still OK. He still had some good runs. It, it, the way he runs and the way he performs is still significant and special for K-State, even in a night like this. He also found the end zone two times. So good for DJ Giddens to uh, get into the end zone. But I don't think you have many concerns about the offense moving forward, except in the health department. Carver Willis did not make the trip to Morgantown because of an injury. And then later on in the game, Hadley Panzer had to leave because of an injury as well. Those will be things to monitor moving forward next week. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, they did some good things. When the ball was in the air, the defense was much better tonight. You felt like they were getting involved. They had a couple of interceptions. Marky Siegel had the pick six. The first one was Jack Fabrics in the game. He's had a couple of big defensive plays this year. Uh, Marky Siegel had another point in the game where he got a hand in and batted a ball away to prevent a first down pickup. So the, the pass defense is getting better when the ball is in the air. They were looking for it a little bit better tonight. There are still some penalties there, but – the tackling felt like it took a pretty big step back for K-State. And the tackling struggled at different points uh, last week, too. If you look at some of the plays that Colorado made, K-State had guys in the area, but they didn't really come through there. Um, and a lot of Colorado to go off, get 5, 10, 15 more yards on certain plays. So it'll be pretty fascinating to see uh, how everything else kind of shakes out uh, with K-State kind of moving forward in, in the defensive department. All right, we're back after a quick pause because uh, working with Drew Galloway to make sure you guys all get your, your press conference uh, video after the game as well. But the defense, the turnovers are a positive. They've been better enforcing the turnovers this year, this, so that's notable. The pass defense getting better. You worry a little bit about some of the other stuff going on with the tackling. That needs to be kind of fixed next week because KU, again, despite their struggles this year, and this has kind of been the – the story for them uh, over really a long period of time. Now, I think they have skill guys that if you're not making the tackles, if you're not keeping them in front of you, they can burn you. So K-State has to be ready for that next week. I think that'll probably be the number one emphasis coming out of this game for the defense, but they did a lot of good things. Seven tackles for loss tonight. Guys were active, uh, drew some holding calls, um, but the, the secondary still has – quite a bit to be desired so that's going to be a fascinating matchup next week is and it might be the one that dictates how the game plays out for k-state is how does k-state defend when the ball's in the air from Jalen daniels to the ku receivers which they got big receivers they make plays that's something to watch moving forward next week now in terms of the the broader scale of what this means for k-state this week the cats are six and one they're three and one in the big 12 they almost got help in the two games they needed big help in this week. They didn't get it, though. Both end up with 38-35 wins for the wrong team if you're K-State. BYU won last night on Friday against Oklahoma State in the final moments of the game, just over a minute to play. 
Iowa State won tonight 38-35 over UCF with under a minute to play with a very questionable pass interference call there at the end. So K-State is still chasing both BYU and Iowa State, who uh, their magic dust season continues as they remain unbeaten. But starting to see some of those cracks in the armor for both of those teams. And uh, K-State still will get their shot against Iowa State. Now, the rest of the race has kind of cleaned itself up. Uh, Arizona State took a loss against Cincinnati today. Uh, that not a great showing for Arizona State, only scoring 14 points. But that str- they struggled because Jeff Sims was playing quarterback instead of Sam Levitt, so they've lost their starting quarterback for a bit. Cincinnati keeps themselves alive for another day, but as I wrote on KSO uh, Friday, Cincinnati's got the toughest schedule remaining out of any of the teams that think they might be a contender in the Big 12 title race. So I don't think you have to worry too much about Cincinnati because they still have to play at Iowa State and at K-State. Um, and there may be a couple of others on there that you go, I don't know that you're going to get those. KU and Houston, uh, it's good bounce back win for KU, but it doesn't mean anything. Colorado keeps themselves in the conversation, and they are going to have a schedule that opens themselves up to possibly have a chance to keep this thing riding out. So K-State's win over Colorado, uh, just like BYU's win over K-State, counts for a little extra. K-State's win over Colorado is counting for a little extra out of those teams that are just behind the 3-0 and uh, squads. And then Texas Tech, I thought there was a chance Baylor could win this game. I did not think that they were just going to blow past them in Lubbock. But Sawyer Robertson, the Baylor quarterback who took over for Daquan Finn, uh, has kind of changed how Baylor has played this year. And he's a Lubbock native, went down there, ran all over Texas Tech. uh, And there you go, 59-35. So Texas Tech, Joey McGuire back firmly into uh, fraud watch territory. And the Red Raiders are out of the Big 12 title race with that loss and then Iowa State as you see keeps things moving there. Uh the last game of the night still going while I'm doing this TCU Utah. I don't think we need to worry about that one. Uh I don't think it has any impact on what happens in the Big 12 the rest of the season, but TCU as I'm recording this is up 10 nothing early. If you're looking around next week, what the teams that you're interested in have going on. K-State obviously playing KU next week. BYU is on the road at UCF. Uh, and then Iowa State, they get their bye week um, because they they had an early bye week for their first one, so they get an early bye week for their second one. So Iowa State will not play again uh, until that first weekend in November. That will be November 2nd. They will be playing against Texas Tech at home. So, uh, again, the schedule for Iowa State is pretty open there with their toughest games left probably now, you you think, rejuvenated KU on the road uh, and then K-State at the end of the year in a home game. So K-State's going to have to go through and uh, keep fighting and probably I mean if they want to have a chance it's looking more and more like they need to to finish this thing off and be 8-1 and one in Big 12 play. We'll see how it ends up working out for them uh, but tonight was a another good step in the right direction. They've ripped off three straight wins since that disappointing night in Provo and now they turn their attention to the Sunflower Showdown as they try to win their 16th straight game against the Jayhawks next week in Manhattan. So that'll do it for us tonight from Case Down Line. I'm Mason Voth. If you want the full post-game coverage from Drew Galloway and Derek Young, who are in Milan Pusker Stadium tonight, you can uh, go to KSO over at On3. Find all of that, and uh, I'm going to shut up for the rest of the night and quit talking, trying to get my voice to sound normal, see if I can breathe again since – before I did this, I grinded through it. You know, had, had to get the the vapo rub for my wife up top here. Uh, that's why it looks like I've got just Edward Cullen shimmering lips uh, right now. I don't know if it helps or not. Maybe it did, uh, but I tried it. I tried my best for you guys tonight. Uh, and also, the the beauty of this was KSU underscore fan was going to join me. He's also sick this week. Uh, much sicker than I am, so everybody hope that he gets better. He's not He's not going to die. I don't want anybody thinking that. I might have made you think that he was going to die. Not going to die. He's just, you know, dealing with crap that's not fun. Sore throat, coughing, all that. Uh, as most know, I, men don't handle colds very well. I certainly am in that boat. Yeah, I would rather have a serious illness than have a, stuff, a stuffy nose and a, a scratchy throat. So, too much talking after I said I was going to be done. We'll get out of here right now. Cats win 45 to 18. Go take in everything Drew and DY did because they had a lot more fun tonight in person and they did a lot better work than I did.